You're listening to Stories Behind the Songs with Chris Blair. For more information, check out chrisblair.com. Hey everybody, here's another episode of Stories Behind the Songs. I'm your host, Chris Blair, and this week I sat down with Tranny Anderson. Now, Tranny grew up in Waco, Texas, playing uh, with melodies and lyrics starting at an early age of six and started playing the piano. She started her journey in music with some basic piano lessons, writing her first song called Magic Carpet. And then she started taking trips to Nashville throughout her college years to get a feel for the city. Uh, During the summer of 2015, Tranny graduated Baylor University, moved to Nashville, connected with artist Lainey Wilson, and also played her first Listening Room Cafe show in November of 2015. Uh, You're gonna hear stories behind the songs that she has written for Gabby Barrett, Adam Doliak, and Walker County, which all resulted in cuts during the same week, which is just crazy. She also wrote, I Needed Christmas, a song for Reba McIntyre's movie, Christmas in Tune, uh, which you can see on Lifetime. And Reba actually called Tranny shortly after she wrote the song to thank her for such a quick turnaround time. This is a really cool story that she's gonna talk about in this episode as well. Uh, Tranny also touches on what it was like hearing her song, Heart Like a Truck by Lainey Wilson played live in several different venues and hearing fans young and old scream her lyrics right next to her in the audience. Just so amazing. Uh, It was such a pleasure having Tranny on the podcast this week and there's much more coming for her as well. Be on the lookout for a song she wrote for Dan and Shay called Missing Someone. That's set to release on September 15th with more on the horizon from Dan and Shay and also some cool things coming up with Cole Swindell. Uh, You're going to hear all about that in this episode. You don't want to miss it. It's a great one. We'll get to it in just a second. But also, just a reminder to please share, follow, subscribe, like all the things, um, these episodes and podcasts, uh, wherever you're listening. We love sitting down with new songwriters, artists, and everyone that works behind the scenes in the music world. And the more that you help spread the word, the more that we can keep doing this. We really appreciate it. Let's get to this episode. Again, this is Tranny Anderson. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Here's another episode of Stories Behind the Songs. I'm Chris Blair, and today I am here at the listening room in Nashville, Tennessee with Tranny Anderson. How you doing? So happy to be here with you, Chris. Absolutely. This is going to be awesome. Um, This feels like my second home, so I'm actually like... (laughs) It's really nice to to be on this stage, as always. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for being here. I know you've got a right today, so we're mm-hmm. gonna uh, we're gonna just dive on in, so you can go uh, get to your writing room and go write a number one. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Your lips, God's ears. Yes, exactly. Um, so, just take me through your story. Um, you know, obviously, I want to get to the hits. So, everybody that's listening, Tranny. Uh, has written a lot for Lainey Wilson, and we're gonna talk about all that. She's got cuts by so many people we're gonna get into. Um, But before we get to that, uh, just walk me through. You're from Waco, Texas, and how'd you get into music and get to Nashville? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm from Waco, Texas, and I started writing songs at a really young age, like six or seven. Um, I like didn't even know how to spell at that (laughs) point, and my mom, noticed I was doing things like that. I was sitting at the stand-up piano that was in our living room. And um, it was my grandma's old one and no one ever played it ever, but I was just fascinated by it like Mm. really early on. So I would sit there and I couldn't even reach the pedals and I was like making up little melodies on the piano. And my mom got me some piano lessons from a Baylor student um, because Baylor is in my hometown. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I told she came over and started teaching me like the basics of piano, like as much as a six year old, seven year old can know. And um, but I started like singing these songs for her and she would write down the lyrics for me. And um, so like the fascination with it was like super early on. So you're not playing like jingle bells or like you know uh hush little baby or like songs that you probably were listening to as a kid you're yeah. making your own songs up it's i was 
That is amazing. My first song was called Magic Carpet. <laughs> wow. Yes. Not Steppenwolf, but your Magic Carpet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Love it. Probably inspired by Aladdin. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so then that, that just carried on. Did you do that then all through school? Yeah. So, I mean, I did a lot of things growing up, uh, a lot of sports and stuff. And my parents, I mean, like they definitely poured into the music side of me, but they wanted me to just be like a normal kid too. Um, so I feel like I didn't like just focus on music until later, but, um, but I remember, um, Sometime like later in elementary school, um, there was a music minister in our hometown named Gary Rhodes, who actually used to write for Word um, because Word, the publishing company, used to be based in Waco, Texas, oh, which is so random. Yeah. I don't remember what years that was, but um, before it moved to Nashville, but um, there were a couple writers in Waco that used to write for Word and just stayed in Waco. And they became music ministers. And so, and they had like won Dove Awards and things like that. And um, anyway, Gary, his son and I were good friends all growing up and he knew that I wrote songs. And so he started giving me songwriting lessons. And I was like, you know, third grade, fourth grader, go into his church office and I'd say, Miss Rhodes, here's a song that I just wrote this week. and. Um, he taught me song structure and all kinds of things and like ended up producing a, an EP for me in middle school. My first EP was like, I was 12 years old. Wow. <laughs> and so I knew of Nashville at a really young age um, because of him. Yeah. And uh, my mom took me for the first time when I was in seventh grade and I recorded with some session musicians here, just like two songs. And that memory um, is just burned in my mind and like it has impacted me at such a young age that I was like, I have to move here someday. Like this is, I just like felt mm. the call yeah. <laughs> to move here. So I had bands in high school and college. I went to Baylor and like played all over Texas. And um, the plan the whole time was like, yeah, I'm gonna move I'm going to finish college and then I'm going to move to Nashville and be a songwriter. Yeah. Was there, um, I, I talked to so many people that as soon as they graduate high school, Mm -hmm. it's like, I want to get there and they either skip college altogether yeah, or they're, you know, coming to go to college here so they can be in the scene. Yeah. Um, why did you stay in Texas? Like, was there a reason or, you know, I think a couple things, my parents are just a little more traditional. Yeah in that way and like I mean my dad wants me to be a banker still (laughs) I have a hit song and he's like yeah you know Trini you should move back to Waco and be a banker (laughs) um (laughs) so that's just how they think and I had the opportunity to go and it wasn't gonna like put me in a bunch of debt or anything and and so and like I was raised to think like in a very balanced way of like, hey, like you you don't pick one thing and that's like your identity in your life. Like you, there are a lot of facets to who you are. And like, so for me, college was just like, oh yeah, that's like, that made, made sense for me. Like I wanted to be in a sorority. I wanted to have friends at college. I wanted to go to all the football games. I like, I wanted to like have a really normal. Yeah. Growing up, you yeah. know. So that's why I chose to stay there. Um, and I just, I also just didn't quite feel ready to move here and like, like emotionally speaking, I guess. I just like, I just wasn't ready to like take Nashville by storm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I totally get that. I, d- I did the same thing. That's why I asked. You did? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad I went. Yeah. I had so much fun. And like still today, some of my best friends are my college buddies. So, um, same. Yeah. All of mine are coming. Uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, they're all, all five of them are going to, we're all going to stay together. And yeah, those friendships are special. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting off music a little bit, but like, is it, is it the same for you? Like when I get together with my college buddies, I think we all do this. Yeah. Like meaning all like in my group of college friends, but it's like, we all get together 
and we pretend like we're back in college. And it's just like, <laughs> it's one of those crazy weekends. It's just like, I get so excited when everybody comes to town, but yeah. I also dread it. Cause I'm like, we act like a bunch of just kids. That's totally how we are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of them, I mean, we're, we're all 30. Um, we all turned 30 this year. Yeah. And so, I mean, most of them have kids yeah. now and it's yeah. like, yeah, it's pretty funny to like, watch the moms go wild for a minute. Yeah. I don't have any kids, but yeah. Oh, it's good for you. Um, <laughs> going wild. Both of them. Anyway. Uh, um, okay. So you, you moved to Nashville. Um, mm -hmm. and then, um, you had your first pub deal with this is us music. Is that right? Uh, uh catch this music, catch this music. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what, like, how long were you in town before uh, before you got that? Yeah. And, um, and then you're with them and then walk me through to Sony. For sure. Um, so I moved here this summer, 2015, after I graduated from Baylor. And I didn't really know a ton of people. I had spent time here during those summers leading up to moving here. Um, just to kind of get my foot in the door and like make sure I wanted to to make the move. And, um, so, but I pretty much started like from the ground up and I posted on Yep, the Young Entertainment yeah. page um, on Facebook, like two days after I moved here, I posted a song I wrote and I said, hey, I don't know anyone. Um, I just moved here from Texas. I'd love to get a cup of coffee or write a song with anyone who wants to and it got a lot of comments, um, like 30 or 40 comments. And um, I got coffee or wrote a song with every single person that commented. Mm. <laughs> and because that's what you do. Like yeah. you, you don't know who you're going to hit it off with. Yeah. And you know where you want to be, but you don't like getting there is you just have to say yes to everything. Yeah. At first. And so um, I wrote a lot, a lot of songs and was working retail and working all kinds of odd jobs and uh, on accident became the country star dog sitter. Um, yeah. yeah, so my, I was like, the, actually the first day that I lived in Nashville and this is like such a crazy God thing because I didn't know many people, but um, do you know who Caroline Hobby is? Yeah. So. Her, she babysat me growing up. She's from my hometown. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah. And she's married to Michael Hobby, lead singer of a Thousand Horses. Yep. And um, Smoke had just gone number one for them. And she was in Runaway June. And their yep. life was just crazy. They were gone all the time. And so I ran into her the first day I lived here. And she was like, hey, um, let's, like, let's get coffee. And we got coffee. And she was like, I need a dog sitter. You want to be my dog sitter? And I was like, yes, I do. Cause I really need money. I'm very poor. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I started dog sitting for her and then it turned into, she had me dog sitting for all of her friends, like Dan and Shay and Eric Pasley and Hunter Hayes and Brett Eldridge and like, you name it. Yep. And I realized like I was making enough money doing that. I realized I could like quit all my other jobs and like live like a gypsy and not, not live anywhere. Just like live in these houses every yeah. week. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was my life for like about a year, the first year in Nashville. That's what I was doing. And a couple of these artists I got really close to and they asked about my songs and I played them some songs and got set up with publishing meetings, got a publishing deal. Um, that was a year and two months into living in Nashville, which I realize is rare. Yeah. Um, but I just walked through all the doors and the weird dog sitting one is the one that yeah. opened up for me and, um, signed there and really small publishing company. Um, Brandon Purdue and Chris Poole were working there at the time and, uh, about a year into my deal, it closed shop yeah. and was a dumpster fire and um two days before I got married is when they closed and I had no idea I was like completely blindsided and uh mm. Brandon called me and was like hey you aren't getting a paycheck next month I'm so sorry like if it were up to me that would not 
be what's happening, but the owner just like, yeah, anyway, it was dumpster fire. Mm. Um, so on my honeymoon, um, Sony reached out to me. Wow. <laughs> So that was like a really fast turnaround. I was expecting to be out of a deal for a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had a couple companies reach out to me and Sony felt like home and I've been there ever since. It's been uh, five and a half years. Yeah. So. They're such a great publishing company. I love those guys. It's changed so much it since has. I've been there yes. too. It's like a completely different publishing company. Yes. Yeah. What Rusty has done over there with the whole vibe is just like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. You just go, even if you don't have a right, you just go hang out. It's like, it's great. I'm happier there than I have ever been. Yeah. So. So, um, so then like th we, we talked a little bit before we, uh, we did this. I think this is interesting. Like the first time that your husband who you were just dating at the time, yeah. the first time he heard you sing yeah was at the listening room. It was, which is really <laughs> cool. I love that. It's really cool. I was like. I didn't remember that fun fact until I was thinking about it this morning. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, I've like had some milestones at the listening room. Yeah. So you <laughs> played uh, first time in like 2015. Is that what we figured yeah, out? Yeah. November like 2015. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and um, after, you know, you're, you're playing um, and now you're with Sony and uh, then you start getting cuts. Mm -hmm. Walk me through like what it was like that first time that you got the call that was like, Hey, your song's going to get recorded. Yeah. I mean, any cut is a cut. I'm very excited yeah. about whether it's indie or a major label or whatever, but I'll, I'll talk about my first major label cut. Um, that was in, I'm trying to remember now, 2019, it was 2019. And um, took me a while to get there, you know? Yeah. And um, Gabby Barrett recorded a song of mine called Hall of Fame um, that I wrote with her and Zach Kale and Adam Doliak. And um, that was my first major label cut. And it was, it felt so good because I had been getting a lot of indie cuts and um, those are amazing too, just like a tougher road to radio and yeah. like you know making yeah. a making a livelihood and um so i was so excited about that because i knew that the label was excited about it and it, the highway started playing it that was the first song i ever heard on the highway of mine um and yeah i mean it was so special but that that week i remember like it started clicking like i got three major label cuts in one week um and it was on Gabby and then Adam Doliak cut a song called Another. And, um, oh shoot, what was the third one? Oh, uh, Walker County cut a song of mine called mm. Shovel. Yeah. Um, and I used to play those at the listening room yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was kind of like the first sign of like, oh, like this is, people are starting to care about the songs I was writing. Yeah. Which was a nice feeling. <laughs> I just like had like deja vu, just was transported back to remembering you sing that shovel oh, at really? Second Avenue and thinking like how cool that was. Aww. I'm trying to remember exactly the lyric, but like, you know, something about like I remember you, it. you like uh you dug you dug the ditch. I just got the uh, like I'm digging up the dirt yeah, or something like that, right? Like uh, I um, did a little digging. He piled on the shovel. I didn't put him in it. I just had the shovel. Yeah, yeah he yeah. dug his own hole. Yeah. Or like, I dug, yeah, anyway. I remember <laughs> hearing that for the first time at Second Avenue. It was like, Aww. wow, that's such a cool song. So yeah. Dude, thanks, yeah. Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah, so was there anything like, anything special in the room um, on any of those songs where you were just like, you walked out of there going, wow, this is like, this is something super special and it's going to do something or was it like you just got the call and was like hey this is getting cut and then then you get excited kind of thing i would say more like that yeah um i have had that experience not with those songs necessarily i have had the experience of like oh i think we just wrote something special mm -hmm. 
Um, but I never get too wrapped up in what I think day of because yeah. a whole bunch of other people need to like it yeah. <laughs> for anything yeah, to happen. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much I like it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, though, like that's also three majors in one week. That's like, so you move to Nashville mm -hmm. and you get the pub deal very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's, that's also like not normal to get your first major label cut and then get three of them in a week. Yeah. I mean, I guess that was like four years into town. I, that sure, started clicking. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, it's like, um, I mean, I hear so many stories of like, you know, your first, your first, like even a number one. And then it's like three years later or something like that before the next big thing. So yeah, that's, yeah. um, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Thank you. And a testament to <laughs> you as a writer. I mean, thank you. I felt like anything good that's happened in my journey so far here has been like, and bad too, good and bad has been like perfectly timed to just like give me what I needed at that moment. And I, um, I mean, I needed, I needed a confidence boost <laughs> yep. um, that, that week that yeah. I got three. And cause I, you know, I was like, had my head down for about three years and didn't really have any cuts. And it was a, it was confidence boost. He gave it to you. Absolutely yeah. he did. And um, I was like, okay, God, like I'm right where I need to be. I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. And um, yeah, I feel like the last couple years I've like experienced that more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about Lainey. Okay. <laughs> I love talking about <laughs> yeah. Lainey. She's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You've got, uh, you had, was it three cuts on uh, Bell Bottom Country? Uh, four cuts. Four cuts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, you've you've been writing and friends with her for a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, let, I'll just I'll just let you talk because you've got some great stories of that and mm -hmm. uh, a huge hit. So walk me through that. Um, well, I met Lainey two weeks after I moved to Nashville. So super early on, um, we had a mutual friend um, named Stephen who moved back to. Waco where I'm from um, the same week I was moving here so that felt like divine timing too yeah. um, because I hadn't seen him in a long time and we got a drink and um, he was like okay this is what you need to know about Nashville this is like <laughs> what it's like and um, he's like also I just I have this feeling that you're gonna really hit it off with this girl named Lainey Wilson and like y'all would just be friends and uh, so he gave me her number before I even moved to Nashville <laughs> and um so I hit her up and uh when I got here and we got coffee at Frothy Monkey and we we talk about that sometimes and she's like I still remember the color earrings earrings you were wearing and wow. like it was like our first date and we like remember the details of that and like yeah I think this we're gonna be friends and um started writing songs together. And the first one of mine that she cut was a song called Middle Finger that I've also played at the yep. Listen Room. Um, and that that was uh, still an independent cut on her because uh, she put that EP out independently um, and then signed with Broken Bow. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was the first sign of like, hmm. I, we can write songs together that you're going to record and that's great. And, um, so, and then we actually went a couple years without writing and, um, just reconnected on creatively, like at just the right time. Um, that was like, well, fall of 2020, um, we started writing together again. And the first song we wrote after two years of not writing a song was heart like a truck. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, since then, I don't even know how many songs we've written. Probably like 45 or 50 or something. Um, yeah. Which on this next record, hopefully she's cutting quite a bit of those. Yeah. Lainey, if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, take me, let's let's talk about Heart Like a Truck. Cause I, I want you to play some of that, if you sure, will. Sure, sure. Um, but 
let's like dive into the story behind that song, like uh, yeah. writer's room and how that came about and kind of the steps after, like how quickly um, it became a cut, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or just the process of what <clears> happened. <throat> For sure. Um, so we wrote that song with uh, our best friend, Dallas Wilson. And we ha the three of us had never written a song together um, until that day. And I'd written a lot of songs with Dallas. She had written a lot of songs with Dallas. I'd written a lot of songs with her, but we had just never done that combo. And, um, and Dallas just had a feeling it was gonna work really well. And um, so our publishers put together. And um, I remember the day before, since I hadn't written with her in a while and she had kind of like started to have a pretty good buzz around town, I was like, I need to go in with something good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I went on a, I got canceled on the day before and I was like, okay, well, that's okay. I'm just gonna like spend today thinking of ideas for Lainey. And um, I was walking around the Greenway at McCabe mm -hmm. and just listening to music and trying to feel inspired. And I thought of the hook heart like a truck on that walk and um, went back to my house and like kind of worked up what I thought was going to be the chorus for it. And um, like had very similar lines as the finished product, but like was super up tempo, um, trying to sound like a single, you mm -hmm. know? And what, what you would think a single would sound like, because we're all trained to push the tempo as much as we possibly can. Um, and so I remember taking that in the next day, hoping she was going to like it. And she, I played it for her and she and Dallas were like, this is super cool. Like love the hook. And we need to probably find a different vibe for it because <laughs> it doesn't feel honest. And, um, and that's, she was like, I, this feels like me. I want to, I want to write a more honest melody and emotional melody for it. And mm. I was like, let's go, let's do it. And, um, so I remember Dallas picking up his guitar and he kind of started playing the verse, what ended up being the verse chords. And, um, Lainey and I were just singing over the top of it, trying to find something. And it started clicking pretty quick. And, um, probably like three hours later, we had the finished product of Heart Like a Truck. Mm. And uh, and I knew it was special. We all knew it was special, but we just didn't know what a Laney Wilson hit sounded like yeah. yet, because things a man ought to know hadn't gone number one at country radio yet. I think at that point it was like at country radio, but no one knew that song yet. Um, so it was still kind of just like, Everybody's first single that blows up is just like a shot in the dark. You don't know what it's yeah. what's gonna hit, you know. So I was hoping we wrote a Lainey song, but I wasn't sure. Um, so I remember about six months went by, and um, she ended up recording it with Jay Joyce, and Jay is one of my favorite producer, probably my favorite producer. I mean, he just like is so creative and. Um, I just love how he thinks and uh, his ear is just so unique and he changed a couple of the progression, like he changed the progression and the bridge. Mm. Um, and that like, to me, just like took heart like truck to a whole new level. Um, so I've, I've taken note of that. All, all the songs I've written since I'm like, okay, I'm going to pretend Jay Joyce is going to produce this and I'm going to make the chords interesting before he does. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so anyway, six months. And then, uh, I remember she played it for me for the first time. Um, me and her were writing with Casey Brown and she was like, Hey, do you want to hear the master heart leg truck? And I was like, uh, yeah. And she played it for me and she told me that was going to be her next radio single. Mm. And I cried Yeah. <laughs> and, um, we were having this moment in front of Casey Brown. I was like, sorry, Casey. Um, and I mean, before it actually was out and became the single, a year went by. So like living with that information in the back of my mind for that long was so hard. Yeah. 
<laughs> because it's always subject to change, you know? Yeah. Gosh, that's, that's so amazing. Then, um, did you ever get to go out with her on tour to, to like witness that and yeah. get, and so, uh, how was that standing side stage watching thousands and thousands of people sing your song back? You know, it's been really cool because um, I've seen it at different stages. I've like seen the audience for it grow. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I saw her play it out was she was on John Party's tour mm -hmm. and Dallas and I went and met her in Las Vegas. And uh, wait, were we there together? Quite possibly. I was there at that tour. You were there? Yes. At that show? Yes. Well, we were then. Yeah, like like with the pool in front. And, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, we. I hung out. I hung out with Lainey that afternoon talking about how long it'd been and what she'd done since Song Suffragettes. Oh my god. We had to gosh. be like right there together. Yeah, I Dallas was, and I were there. I was with Party's Camp. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, a good friend of mine uh, at the time was his TM, so I was on that tour. Gotcha. Um, that's so crazy. I didn't know that you were there. <laughs> it's like, crazy. Then yeah, we didn't I was, run into each other. I was especially there. Especially afterwards, like after the concert, like yeah. where everybody was like kind of partying after it. Like we had to be like <laughs> hanging out right next to each other and didn't that's even know so it. That's so crazy. Yeah. Well, that was a really fun show. Yeah, it was. And that was yeah. the first time I heard her play Heart Like a Truck live. Yeah. And people didn't know it, you know, um, because it had just come out. And um, so I just remember, like, just kind of going, okay, so, like, this is what it feels like now. And then two months later, I went to another show, and there were more people singing it. And then, like, fast forward to now she's on the Luke Combs tour playing stadiums. And I'm watching 60,000 people sing my song. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just not a feeling like that. So it, it was being her friend and like having her take me along for the ride on a lot of those shows too. I feel like I got to experience the growth of, mm -hmm. of a song more than I probably will with some other singles that I hopefully have. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my favorite part of all of that, though, especially now, um, I'm just thinking of the last show I went uh, that she played, which was Dallas and I went out with her um, when she played a whole bunch of casinos in Oklahoma. Uh, this was like probably about six weeks ago. And um, I was out in the crowd. I, I prefer to be out in the crowd instead of side stage. Yeah. Cause then I'm like a fan and I get to like really enjoy the show. Yeah. And um, I just remember like looking to my right, looking to my left and there's like sweet little girls that are 12, 13 to my right that are screaming this song with everything in them Oh my God. and emotional about it. And like, I know that that song is like, I just got chills, like a part of them, you know? And then I look to my left and there's this, 60 year old man screaming and <laughs> like with all he's got in him. And I'm like, that is just so amazing mm. to like see a song have that much mean that much to that many types of people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can't even imagine. It's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thankful for it. Yeah. Well, you want to, uh, you want to play part of it? Mm-hmm. Let me go over here. place too long a dirt road singing me a siren song i gotta find a field i need to spin my wheels yeah i got a anchor in for four wide tires and i can't help it it's the way i'm wired for you get too close boy you need to know i got a heart like a truck it's been drug through the mud Runs on dreams and gasoline And that old highway holds the key It's got a left foot down when it's leaving Lord knows it's taking a hell of a beating A little bit of love is all that it's needing But it's good as it is tough 
got a heart like a truck This episode is brought to you by Brit Skin Beauty. Located in the beautiful Indulgence Medi Spa in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, Brittany is the go-to esthetician for facials, dermaplaning, microdermabrasion, waxing, lashes, and any skincare products and consultations. So many people in the music industry use her frequently, and her work speaks for itself. To schedule your next consultation or make an appointment, visit BritSkinBeauty.com or send an email to BritSkinBeauty at gmail.com. That was so great. I love that song. <laughs> <Chris>. <laughs> um, all right, let's. Uh, I want to. I want to uh, like get you out of here in time for your right. Um, but I want to go back because you have uh, you have some stuff that you did early on that I think is super cool because mm-hmm. uh, it's also uh, not radio; it's TV. Yeah, um, I love doing that too. You also have some really exciting things coming up that I want to make sure that we hit on. So. Sure. Um, but you have a song that got cut by Reba McIntyre. Reba McIntyre, baby. Yeah, so <laughs> that's pretty sweet. Very sweet. Um, and that was a Christmas special. Um, so yeah, how did how did that happen? And like, yeah. what was that like? Well, that was another instance of me getting canceled on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'm just telling all y'all listening, if you're a songwriter, sometimes the best thing that can happen to you is you get canceled on that yeah. day, but you got to make the most of it. You got to choose to not be upset about it and go make lemonade. And um, so that day I was like, man, I really like, really want to do something just cool and different today with my time. And Dale Bobo, who's at, over at Sony, um, amazing publisher, amazing person. Uh, he called me and was like, hey, uh, this is kind of a Hail Mary, but Reba McIntyre needs a song for her Lifetime movie. And um, I was like, all right, you know Challenge what? Challenge accepted. You know what? Yeah. That's what I'm going to do today. And so I called my friend Jared Conrad. And um, I was like, hey, you want to take our shot at this? And... Um, he was so smart because we didn't get any information about what the movie was about or anything. And um, we just looked up press releases for it online and it kind of gave us the premise of the movie. And we were like, all right, well, that's enough to go off of. So we wrote a song called I Needed Christmas. And the movie was about this divorced couple getting back together at the end of the movie. Sorry to spoil your lifetime movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so we knew that like I needed Christmas to find my way back to you is the hook. And um, so anyway, we wrote the song and Reba's team, we turned it in the next day. Reba's team freaked out. She cut it the day, n- the next day. Wow. <laughs> so it was like a three day turnaround. Yeah. And they filmed the movie like the following week. And so it was really crunch time for them. And um, what's so funny is the song ended up becoming such an integral part of the movie. They like threaded the song throughout the entire movie. Um, And it was just so cool. And Reba gave me a phone call, which was so classy of her. Yeah. Um, I remember I was in a write and um, Dale gave me a heads up like, hey, Reba might call you today. And I was like, okay, that's pretty crazy. And um, so I was in my right and I get this call from an unknown number. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this has got to be Reba. And um, so I, I was like, I'll be right back. I didn't tell my co-writers. There was just like a lot going on. And I stepped out and I picked it up and she goes, hi, Tranny, this is Reba McIntyre. And um, we talked for a couple minutes and she was so kind and thanked me so much for writing the song last minute and anyway very cool and wow. i get to enjoy that lifetime movie for i'm gonna make my future kids someday yeah. watch it every yeah. christmas yeah, they're will. gonna hate yes. it <laughs> oh my gosh that's amazing <laughs> so um let's let's also talk about the exciting things that you have coming out you've got a couple for things sure. that are that are happening right now so yeah. what should everybody look out for well i'm very thankful that outside cuts are 
happening again. <laughs> I like, I'm having plenty of songs cut by artists that I'm writing the songs with them and that's just means so much because those are always really honest, but it's such a great feeling when you wrote a song that somebody thinks is so good that they're okay not having their name on it and and they can pour their identity into something that they weren't in the room for. I just, mm. that means so much to me as a songwriter. Yeah. And I've had a couple of those recently. Um, one of those is on Dan and Shay, who I used to dog sit for. <laughs> <laughs> and I love telling that story when I play. Uh, it's called Missing Someone. Um, I've been playing it at the listen room and telling the story about how I used to be <laughs> pick up poop in the front yard. Yeah. And um, so I'm really excited about that one. Um, that's coming out September 15th, which is my birthday. <laughs> um, and I'll be in Italy actually. So that'll be, wow. That'll be a good day. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wrote that one with, uh, Adam Doliak and Adam and I write some good songs together. Yeah. Um, and Gordy Sampson and Dylan Guthrow and, uh, Adam texted it to Dan and it's the only outside cut on the record. And I'm just so thankful. And Dan and Shay have been so sweet and uh, been writing with me and um, yeah, just like pouring into me as a friend and a songwriter yeah. since then. Um, and then another one I'm really excited about is with Cole Swindell. I um, feel like I can't like dive into the details of that one yet. Yeah, a little he, early. He just, yeah, he just recorded that one um, really recently, but it's called Three Feet Tall. And um, it's one of my favorite songs I've written this year with Jordan Walker and Trey Lewis. Mm, yeah. And um, so I'm really excited to see the journey of both of those songs. Yeah, I can't wait to, to watch what happens and um, mm -hmm. just so happy for all the success. Like, Thank you. From the early days of playing Listening Room and just everything that's happened since then, it's been, it's been fun to kind of be a speck on the wall in the back of the room watching everything wow. happen. Thanks, Chris. And I got to thank you so much for creating an environment here for us to get on stage and share our music mm. and create new fans. And I mean, it's just like the listening room is my favorite place to play in Nashville. Like it mm. truly is. And I feel like I've learned so much playing here because um, I, I don't want to be an artist, but I love playing my songs for people and um it's given me so many opportunities to grow in that and um learn what works and what doesn't and yeah. it feels safe and um and you I mean you sell out every freaking night so it's like <laughs> <laughs> there's always like a really full house that has a lot of energy to play for so thanks for creating such an uh, amazing venue for us well thank you for being a part of it we wouldn't be here without people like you so yeah <laughs> well it's a it's a win-win <laughs> yes yes well uh before we wrap up I always like to end on the same question mm -hmm. so um if you go back knowing everything that you know now and everything that you've done um you go back to Waco Texas mm -hmm. and you're talking to eight-year-old trainee what advice do you give yourself today wow I think what I would say, and this is something I'm dealing with now, um, I, I'm a pretty proactive person and I think that's good, but it can be a curse sometimes <laughs> because if you're, if you're really proactive, you want to see results yeah. and you want to see them the way you envision them happening. And I mean, I guess it's like a sense of like, you want to, sense of control in some way and that's just not how life works like in this industry mm. or anything really and um so I think I would just like tell myself to relax a little bit more and just keep the joy and the gratefulness every day even when I'm not seeing the results I want because they're coming mm, that's and so good. like I've seen the Lord over and over and over in my life provide the perfect thing at the perfect time. And when it seems like he's not working yeah. and he is a hundred percent, he is. 
Um, it's just like us having to learn to fully trust in that process and um, be grateful on the, the hard and the beautiful days. Yeah, love that. Great advice. <laughs> uh, well, thank you again for being here today and sharing Thanks your time. Me. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and we'll have to uh, come back in a, a, a year or so and sure. talk about everything that happened since. So I would love to do that anytime. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. This has been another episode of Stories Behind the Songs, and you've been listening to Tranny Anderson. We'll see you next time. This has been an episode of Stories Behind the Songs with Chris Blair. For more information after the show, head over to chrisblair.com. That's where you can find information on these episodes, trailer notes, video links, all kinds of great stuff. Also, make sure to leave us a great rating on iTunes. Like and follow us on Spotify, YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. I really hope that you think this show is awesome and we really appreciate the love and support. I promise to keep gathering great content and continuing to sit down with more amazing songwriters and artists as we grow. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for the support. We'll see you next time.